Hi, I'm Joe Feeks, editor of Poultry Health Today. And with me is Kalen Cookson. He's a veterinarian and also director of clinical research for Zoetis. Kalen, thank you for joining us. Thanks, Joe. Kalen, I know that you look at a lot of different diseases, but I know you spend a lot of time on infectious bursal disease. It's a complicated topic. What are some of the myths and misconceptions that are out in the field right now about IBD? Well, uh, one common misconception, I believe, is uh, that if you have a high IBD challenge in a given complex, that you must have an exotic IBD virus challenge. And, and really, it, it, it generally comes down to some deficit in the program itself, uh, that the, the, the backbone of the immune program is, is for whatever reason, not getting expressed and transferred down from the hen to the progeny. Why would they think it's exotic? Well, because it looks exotic. When, when you have a, a high IBD challenge, say you have a, a 20 to 40 percent of your flocks that are becoming infected by two weeks of age, um, it looks exotic because it's causing significant immune suppression in your program. and so. And then, as you know, when you have immune suppressed flocks, you can have all kinds of other opportunistic problems. You can have a lot more respiratory disease, a lot more E. coli, um, even gut health can be compromised. A lot of sequelae to immune suppression. So, um, you know, I, I guess one of the first assumptions would be if I'm having such high challenge, then I must be having an IBD virus that I didn't have yesterday. And specifically, you're talking about in broilers that they would make that Correct. conclusion? Now, let's talk about some of the other misconceptions. I think one has to do with whether or not IBD started in the broiler breeder or whether it started in the broiler. The, the IBD infection, is all, it, it, there, there's no vertical transmission of IBD from the hen to the progeny, um, but there is certainly, hopefully, a significant transfer of maternal immunity from the breeder to its progeny. And that is really the backbone of uh, the, uh, the protection that the broiler is going to be armed with uh, against the field challenge. So when do the broilers typically get infected? At what age? Well, ideally, uh, the window of challenge where we feel like you should have fairly good control of your program would be a window between, say, 17, 18 days and 25, 26 days of age, where we see companies running into immune suppression from IBDV is when that window starts to uh, move in uh, closer to two weeks of age, sometimes inside of two weeks. So with the questions about maternal antibodies, I mean, could you just focus on broiler vaccination and not really worry about the maternal antibodies that you are getting from the broiler breeder? Yeah, the problem is uh, the vaccines that we have available for the broilers, um, there's a, a gap in, in immune response to where you have significant immunity, even if you ap apply the vaccines in the hatchery, um, you, you, you will not obtain maximal immunity until after, say, three weeks of age. So you still, um, the the major opportunity from IBDV is in that first two to two and a half weeks, and maternal antibodies are still the most effective, efficient way to prevent those infections. There are several variants to infectious bursal disease, uh, not unlike some other diseases, I guess. Um, how do they know which variant they're working with, and how do they then chart the, the battle plan? Good question. Um, today, we, we rely a lot on molecular typing, uh, specifically sequencing analysis. And so we, we, we have a pretty good idea when we get a sequence on a virus, how homologous it is to some of our past variants that have now been uh, well characterized, such as AL2, the AL2 virus, which really emerged about 20 years ago um, and was demonstrated on the shore in progeny challenge studies 
to be unique in its ability to override maternal immunity and infect flocks earlier. So, you know, we, we know, we recognize certain viruses uh, today uh, that are more prone to infect and, and cause, immune, uh, cause immune suppression from early infections uh, relative to, say, a Delaware E virus. I know that when you're talking about infectious bursal disease, a, a lot of adjectives get batted around in presentations about subclinical and classical and virulent and very virulent and so forth. I guess that that's a measure of how pathogenic the, the disease is. Well, there's a couple ways we characterize IBD viruses. Uh, one is on their pathogenic capacity, and that's uh, where you talk about uh, virulent versus very virulent. We, we have a little bit of very virulent IBDV in the U.S., but really not a significant amount of it. Um, so for the most part, we're just dealing with virulent viruses and so what separates them in production from a broiler standpoint is what they look like antigenically. Okay, so that's the other way we can uh, characterize IBD viruses. And that's where predominantly what our broilers see today are the large class of variant viruses. We know that there are lots of vaccines out there for infectious bursal disease, but they can get confusing. Um, could you just walk us through the, the different types and give us a, a better handle on which vaccine would be more suitable at which time or in which type of operation? If we're talking on a broiler side, we have essentially three types of IBD vaccines. We have your conventional modified live vaccines. You have your uh, recombinant vaccines, HVT, IBD vaccines, and you have your immune complex vaccines, which are a combination of uh, antibodies specific to IBDV complexed with a modified live vaccine. So those are your three types. They each serve um, a, a different mechanism of action. Um, your modified lives that are used, for example, in the hatchery, tend to be on the mild side and are the most limited in, in what, what they will achieve in immunity. Uh, their main advantage is to help, uh, help block out uh, early infections and they do that to a limited degree. Um, your immune complex vaccines uh, are able to block out um, early infections more capably because they're more active uh, vaccine virus and they uh, they start to express between two and four weeks of age depending on maternal antibodies and then the other type is your recombinant vaccines and they're most um, competent when you have a solid maternal immunity program and you you prevent infections out to three weeks of age where the recombinants start to really kick in so I guess the immune complex vaccines are a bridge between your, your mild lives and your recombinants as far as that, that gap between early and, and late infection. You talk a lot about priming programs for uh, infectious bursal disease. What exactly are they and what's their potential influence on IBD titers? There are, are two basic types of vaccines available for uh, a, a priming program. Uh, there are the recombinant vaccines and then there are the modified live vaccines. Historically, uh, live priming was achieved with conventional live vaccines um, and, and really was driven by the last live vaccine given usually between five and six weeks of age. Uh, and using a, a strong vaccine. And this is for the broiler breeder? This is for the broiler breeder, for the pullet. Um, and that, that program has always worked well in uh, stimulating um, immunity to IBDV so that the birds will respond better to the killed vaccines that they receive between 10 and 20 weeks of age. Now, more recently, people have started um, 
adding recombinant vaccines to their program, which is given in the hatchery, which is fine. It, it helps protect the pullet from IBDV, and it does help prime, I think, in a more limited degree compared to a strong vac live vaccine. Um, I would still personally um, like to see a, a strong live in a program like that. And why is that? I think if you're relying just on the recombinant, I think on your first round of, of, that, uh, of that program, it will do well because your field challenge is still very present. And so it acts as a booster on top of that recombinant vaccine that you're giving. But I, my, my hunch is uh, with continued cycles of flock placements in an environment that have just relied on recombinant, that the, the field presence, that challenge, because the recombinant is fairly effective against a challenge that generally is coming in at four to six weeks of age, that uh, over time, there's less of that field challenge to serve as that booster on top of the recombinant. And so overall, I think your live priming effect wanes with each, with each cycle of uh, recombinant use if that's all you're relying on. So I think over time, it can have an impact on on your kill program. With the trend toward antibiotic-free production, does that put more pressure on an IBD vaccination program to make sure you get it right? Because it, what we're really talking about here is optimizing the immunity of the bird or the immune system. Well, I, it, it puts pressure on everything. Um, and so um, the things that we can control uh, specifically IBDV and Reovirus early challenge and, and hits to the immune system become even more crucial um, because we're leaning more on the immune system to get the job done and protecting against these other diseases when we take other, other uh, tools away. Now we started our discussion talking about misconceptions. Are there some misconceptions about getting a high challenge situation in the broiler? Well, yeah, uh, one misconception I think is uh, just the assumption if you have a high challenge that you have a, an IBDV exotic type of antigen that your birds uh, the, and your program is not equipped to address. And a lot of times what it really comes down to is there are some fundamental, uh, there's something fundamental about the program that is not quite where it needs to be. So uh, the knee-jerk reaction might be, let's, let's take the viruses that we're recovering and let's put it in a bottle, and that will solve our problems. When sometimes it comes down to inadequate priming of the breeder flocks, um, poor application of the killed vaccines, um, for whatever reason, some interference with the expression of the killed vaccines that are in the program so that the, the hens are not optimally passing on the immunity that they should be deriving from the kill program itself. So there's a lot of blocking and tackling that, that should be explored before going to uh, you know, some approaches that would intuitively to some seem to be an easier, an easier step when they, they might not actually solve the problem. This is a really complex topic, obviously, so it, you'd see where people would get these misconceptions and so forth. Um, any others come to mind? Well, you know, um, it's interesting, you know, about 20 years ago, we found a, a variant virus that seemed to crash the party on maternal antibodies, and we, that's known as the AL2 virus. AL2. Right. And we did a survey, a large survey, a couple years ago across the U.S., and we found that, that that virus has really become the dominant um, type uh, in, in U.S. broilers. Um, and so, you know, when, when people talk about having a high IBDV challenge, most of the viruses are not that different from the AL2 virus. And we, we know that with, with some of our basic programs that we can do a good job of addressing those type viruses. So we, 
we shouldn't always assume that, you know, uh, that uh, because we have a high challenge that, that we need to, you know, go to some non-conventional methods to protect against it. Mm -hmm.